This is move 3, and black is dead lost. But what's shocking, is that after d4 d5, knight c3 knight f6 and bishop f4, the most common move, all the way up to 1600 rating on the Leeches database, loses on the spot. This is the Joe Bava London system and this is the most fun you will have under Joe Biden's administration. Because how on earth will black defend against knight takes c7 check, forking the king and the rook? Rook b8? No, because that walks into bishop takes c7, forking the rook and the queen. The best move for black in this position is to give away a pawn via e5 blocking the bishop's view of c7. But pawn takes threatens the knight, and after knight e4, a natural move, white uncorks a level of nastiness, dirtier than my midnight search history on Friday. Queen takes d5, stealing a pawn right in your face. The most obvious response by black, will lose yet another pawn, and castling rights. Pause the video and find the beautiful sequence of moves because, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I have prepared three nasty example games to demonstrate that nobody, up to 2300, can really defend against a dirty, trap-infested king side pawn storm. But first please help me grow my small chess channel by hitting the subscribe button. This is the Joe Bava London system. And after knight f6 and bishop f4, this wise beginner avoids all knight b5 shenanigans by playing the move, c6. e3 protects d4 and opens the way for the bishop. A solid setup for black in this position, borrows an idea from the well-known Karo Khan defense. Black develops his bishop to f5, and then makes an impenetrable pyramid of pawns. Impenetrable? Let's find out. f3. Yes, as soon as you see bishop f5, f3 is the move that prepares all forms of insanity on the king side. e6 completes the pyramid and g4, initiates the kingside pawn storm. Bishop retreats and h4, comes with a simple threat, h5, and the bishop is gone. So black responds with h6, giving the bishop an escape square on h7. Bishop d3, because it's usually a good idea to gain an extra move, by trading a piece that has moved twice, for yours that has moved only once. Granted the pieces are of equal value of course. You do not want to trade your queen, for a bishop that has moved five. You know what, I won't insult your common sense with that explanation. Takes, queen takes and after bishop d6 and knight e2, black commits the aforementioned inaccuracy. A bishop moves twice to capture a bishop, that had moved only once. If this was an open position, like in the Evans gambit, Smith Mora or Danish gambit, black would already be in serious trouble. So in the next few moves, white does just that, he opens up the position. Takes takes, takes takes and black, is starting to feel like he is a move behind in this game. You want a castle, you want to save your knight, but all you have is one move. This is what it feels like to be in debt. Those who have degrees please confirm down below. Knight g8 is the logical move, and now rook h8, infiltrates black's position. After castles and queen h7, black's kingside is about to disappear. Knight e7, the rooks are exchanged and white, wins the first pawn. Knight f5 and white, wins the second pawn. Black captures on e3 and now checkmate, is in 3 moves. Can you find it? <laughs> Who are we kidding? Knight takes e6 check, king c8 is the only move, and after queen e8 check, and queen shields, it becomes clear that this game only took this long, because black chose to castle queen side. So what happens, when black decides to castle, right into the pawn storm? d4 knight f6, knight c3 g6 and bishop f4, is the Joe Bava London system. A master level player would go d5 in this position, and stake his claim on the center. But black is a pure king's Indian defense player, so bishop g7 e4 and d6, is more his style of play. Queen d2 and now the stage is set. Black will castle king side, white will castle queen side, and as it goes in all opposite side castled positions, the idea is to get to your opponent's king by any means necessary. So these types of games are usually crazy explosive, and this one was no different. Black develops his knight and again, our old friend f3, is on the board. You should have an idea what's about to happen. Only this time, black's king is stuck on the stormy side of the board. But what's the best way to attack this solid kingside defensive setup? This bishop is the glue that's holding the entire structure together. So what you need, is a queen and bishop battery on this diagonal and a rook and pawn combination on this file. The idea here is bishop h6 undermining the glue, then h4 and h5 to break open the position. Note that, knight takes h5 is often a huge blunder because of, rook takes h5, and if pawn takes, queen g5 and checkmate is inevitable. 
a simple attacking line here, is takes takes, takes takes, queen check, and checkmate. But it won't always be this smooth in practice, so let's see how this game went. After f3, black played a6 preparing his own pawn storm, bishop h6 and b5. Both players understand the mission. First to the opponent's king, wins. So white plays which move? That's right, h4, and after pawn to b4, white had a choice to make. Knight d5 or knight e2. Knight d5 has the merit of removing a key defender of black's king. But knight e2, which was played in the game, means the knight might be used as a defender of white's king at some point in the game. a5 h5 and a4 set the theme of the game. All out attack. But it seems like white's missiles might land faster than black's. Because after this series of captures, queen check and king retreats, one piece, is holding the position together for black. So the best move for white here is? e5, chasing away the knight. Because if captures captures, guess what, there's a new threat you have to attend to. This knight is gone. So black accepts that he is down a piece, and plays rook f7 defending white's infiltration point. Sacrificing a piece to pump the brakes on your opponent's attack is often a good idea, if your own attack still needs a move or two to take shape. Black's problem however, was that white's attack simply, never stopped. Knight f4. With the devastating threat of capturing on g6, takes and checkmate down the h-file. So black defends with knight e7, but white adds another attacker with bishop c4, d5 and bishop d3 putting more pressure on g6. Sometimes the attack just flows smoothly in your favor. Black tries to entice white to trade his deadly attacker, for this useless bishop on the corner. Not today sir. Knight takes g6, knight takes and bishop takes, threatens the rook and the a7 pawn. You can only defend one, so black sacrifices? The rook! Well, in a sad and rather depressing manner. Queen takes and knight h3, was white's way of introducing another attacker to the game. It's still a few moves away from where it needs to be though, so this is black's chance to throw in a few jabs. You never know, you might get a quick knockout. b3, takes takes and a3, is how you throw a wet blanket on these pawn advances. Because good luck getting to this king once it's on a1. Rook a7. I guess to provide lateral defense of this h7 pawn. Knight f4, c6 and knight h5, arrives to finish black off. Queen g6 merely delays the inevitable, because in case you haven't noticed, white is a full rook up. So takes takes, knight takes and guess what, this rook is also about to fall. Sometimes you get a position, where all the tactics just seem to work in your favor. But how do you actually get to such a position? Not even Magnus Carlsen can answer that question. Chess needs you to have a little bit of faith. You obey chess principles in the opening, have the correct plan in the middle game, and you trust that the gods of chess, will reward you with a beautiful position at the end. Rook h8 check, king e7 and rook h7 check, wins the rook. A normal person would resign here. If not, you have my go-ahead to promote seven queens and end the game in a brutally sadistic fashion. But White was a religious man, a Jehovah's Witness if I'm not mistaken. So he found a quick way to put his opponent out of his misery. Rook e5 and g5, is a poetic end in the theme of the aggressive, Joe Bava London kingside pawn storms. But can you get away with this craziness? Against an equally aggressive, master level opponent? The only guarantee is that there will be blood on the board. d4 knight f6, bishop f4 g6 and knight c3, is the Joe Bava London system. But this time, a principal d5 is played, staking claim on the center. You do this so your enemy pieces don't have an easy path via the center straight to your king. Chess principles protect you from threats, you are not yet strong enough to see. Like when your parents tell you to stay away from that one girl, but you don't listen to them, because, they voted for Joe. You know what, this is a bad example. Anyway, white settled for e3, since e4 loses a pawn. And after bishop g7, in a quiet position, on a warm summer afternoon in Yemen, h4, triggers the madness and dares black to castle king side. He calls white's bluff. But was it really a bluff? h5, and you may think the idea here, is to sacrifice this pawn to open up the h-file, and eventually mobilize to form a mating attack on h7. A mating attack? I swear, chess words sometimes be sounding like serious crimes if you think about it. Anyway, no. It's the shocking, rook takes knight, pawn takes and queen takes threatening the d5 pawn. After c6, the idea is to use these minor pieces, as well as the open h-file to checkmate black's king at the corner. So black plays f5 to avoid mate, but the knight begins his journey towards black's king. Queen e8. A move in line with principles. When your king is under attack, or you are ahead in material, 
you always want to trade queens, because by doing so you significantly reduce the chances of an abrupt checkmate. So white keeps the queens on the board by playing queen h2, gaining a tempo on the knight. After knight d7 and castles, black is still up in exchange. Meaning if he can hold on, he will likely win in the end game. So knight f6 adds a defender to black's king, but rook h1 adds another attacker. e6 solidifies the pawn shielding white's killer bishop from h7, because that's where the game will be won and lost, which should make it clear why white desperately wants to play the move g4. So he prepares it with knight e5. Black resists with h5, but after our old friend f3, g4 is inevitable. White decided to shift his focus to the queen side. c5, black ignores, and after c4 and bishop retreats, pawn to b5, was black's way of skillfully combining defense with attack. This is a high-level chess game. You can tell when players understand that, pawn takes pawn, is not a forced move in a chess position. So after saying that, naturally, the next move by white here was? Yes, pawn takes pawn. With the simple idea of h6, bishop h8 and h7 check, knight takes and checkmate. Black played knight d7, so that after h6, his bishop isn't forced to go to h8. In fact, it captured on e5, takes and king h7, is a fancy defensive tactic called the imposter pawn. Because instead of this pawn being a tool in white's attacking arsenal, black uses it as a defensive shield, and a good one at that, because unlike a black pawn, this one can never be captured by white. If only the G file was closed, Black's king would have been safe and sound. But Rook G1, is a nasty move. Because how on earth do you defend against Rook G7 check, King H8 and Rook E7 discovered check, winning the queen. Rook F7 was played. But Rook G7 check anyway, because if takes, pawn takes discovered queen check, and Black's king will be butchered in a brutal fashion. Black opts for a more dignified death with King H8. Rook F7 check and after King G8, can you find the two simple moves that made me wish life was as easy as chess? Like, find checkmate in two simple queen moves. But can you find a girlfriend in two moves? How do I pay my rent in two moves? What's the best way to grow this YouTube channel? And how can I get it done in two moves? So the best way to get something done, if you, if it holds near and dear to you that you, uh, um, like to be able to, anyway.